Steve is going to talk a little bit about some upcoming events and uh, what's going on with River Relief and uh, the, I guess the Kansas City cleanup uh, that we're going to do October 20th with Healthy Rivers. And then uh, we'll have our uh, uh, speaker, Ethan, will talk about the birdies. Birdies here and gone. And uh, what we can do about them. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Steve Schnarr and I work for Missouri River League. Um, we're, we're one of the partnering organizations that helps put on the speaker series here and, um, and it actually goes on uh, every month in St. Charles and Roachport too, which is pretty cool. And we're sharing a lot of the same speakers, so uh, it's like a cross-state education on the Missouri River, a pretty cool thing. Um, just wanted to throw out a few events that are happening kind of regionally uh, that we're helping out with. Um, on October 6th, um, oh great, I have, actually I have flyers for a St. Joseph cleanup here that has the wrong date on it. That's awesome. Good job, Steve. <laughs> so, what's that? In Kansas City is the right date, believe it or not. Um, but apparently these St. Joseph ones have the wrong date. That's, that's great. Um, but uh, we are doing a river cleanup in St. Joseph on October 6th. And we always have a lot of people from Kansas City come up for, for that. And hopefully we'll see some of you guys there. Um, then October 20th is uh, the, the biggest Missouri River cleanup that happens um, anywhere. And it's at Cockroach Park. And Vicki Richmond with Health, Healthy Rivers Partnership, is, this is like the the big inaugural event uh, where we can work together and, and really kick things off in Kansas City in a big way. Um, so we're really excited about that. Hope we, we see a lot of your faces. I already see a bunch of familiar faces, which is cool. Putting that one on <laughs> um, And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Dave Staus and Fran Staus. They, they've been taking um, all this stuff that we've all been learning about the Missouri River and trying to get into classrooms. Um, and right now they're in the middle of a, a month-long project in North Kansas City uh, teaching kids about the Missouri River, what their relationship is to it, whether they know it or not, um, and how, how important all of our waters are to us. And that's like really exciting and I think that's going places. And thanks a lot. Yeah. Guys. It's like a super treat to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight, Ethan Duke. He's he's one part of a really amazing organization that's sprung up in the last few years. That's working all across the state, um, trying to keep tabs on what's going on with our bird populations. Um, the Missouri River Bird Observatory is the brainchild of Ethan and Dana, who's also in the back corner there, um, and we. We'll, just really excited to find out all we can tonight about what what needed to learn learn about birds. So Ethan, this microphone, you want to come up here? You want me to take it to you? Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? Maybe? I don't want to have to seat down like this all the time. There. Alright. Well, it's a big crowd here. It's nice to see everybody's enthusiasm for the river. I guess that's why we're here, is we're here to talk about the river. I'm here to talk about birds. I guess he had somebody who talked about bees last night. Bees last night, so we have the birds and the bees. Don't program people if you're here for that. This is the Missouri Little Bird Observatory. Um, Honored to be said by Dana and myself. Um, there's me, 
and her dogma was on a tributary of the Missouri River known as the Mississippi. <laughs> River called the Tennessee River in upstate New York, and uh, grew up sort of a river rat. You know, I, I don't know if you know what it's like to grow up on the river, but it was not as big as either of these rivers, but it was a good sized river. I grew up fishing and fly fishing and bass fishing, and my father grew up trapping. And remember in the wintertime, we cut off pieces of ice, pieces of ice with a hatchet, and float down the river. And, I suppose, and things like that that kids probably don't do these days. <laughs> but, um, I, I went out and uh, I got a bachelor's degree in upstate New York City of Wildlife Management at a really cool school. Uh, I'm using the GI Bill, which is really helpful. And uh, I spent a lot of years just on bird research projects, working for state organizations, federal organizations, NGOs, universities, that sort of thing, just deciding where I wanted to go. And this person helped me out with that, because we decided we would co-found the Peru Observatory. Dana grew up in Chicago and, and discovered uh, that she liked birds and things in Illinois, in college there, and then went on to Arkansas, so we did practice some things up in Washington. And then we researched throughout the U.S. and worked for another big bird observatory. We're a very small bird observatory. She worked for a big one out there, the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory in Colorado is quite big. But here's our little when you find it a web. If I don't cover things, I can't cover all that we do because we do a lot of stuff. But if you find us online, it is pretty useful. Um, our website has a lot of information. Organizational and project content is up there. It's pretty easy to navigate. We have upcoming events, but they're not as good as the ones that I find that Steve puts on out there. Those guys that, that look good, but um, it's there. The content is there. It just maybe it doesn't look as nice as yours, but it's, it's there. Um, our annual report from this year and our previous years on there, so you can find out about all our stuff there. It's pretty condensed. This year, I think our annual report is like 38 pages, something like that. So, learn about us there. And then, if you're one of these people, now we don't do a lot of Facebook, and we do blog a little bit, but like our interns, like our intern looks back there right now, Joanna from Wisconsin. Uh, hi. And hi, Joanna. She's still in the house. Yes. All right. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, she, she, she's, uh, but anyways, these guys put some content online for us that we appreciate on Facebook and uh, that other blog thing. We write some blogs, but it, it's there. I'll touch briefly on the education and outreach. You mentioned some, some program here, Steve, that's coming up with you guys with that education that's uh, connecting kids to the river and that sort of thing. Well, we work with that, but a lot of people don't want to support that funding. You know, so we find ways to, to do it. Um, one thing we do is we try to get kids out there near the river, and we try to get them outside. And we just got certified as Flying Wild uh, Facilitators by a national training program where we can actually facilitate, sort of teach teachers about connecting birds and bird education with their curriculums in schools, um, which is uh, it's a, it's a good way to go. We learned a lot about making a good positive connection there with kids. You, know, you can't inundate them with things, like negative things, the river's wrecked and all this horrible stuff. You can just put the blinders on later. So uh, we, we learned a lot of good stuff. So we, we help with that. And so we go inside the classroom all ages. There's me with some little, little kids and I have long hair. Back in the day, you know, and just give them good experiences teaching them about birds. And so we bring them out there in the field. We have college students, um, interns like Joanna back there. We actually have college classes come and visit us in our field stations. Uh, and we provide internships. Um, and it's all paired with research. So these people are learning valuable field techniques uh, as, as well as just sort of the field, the general field of biology. 
And we do a little bit of citizen science with a project called Backyard Banding, so we backyard band birds. And um, we also do a purple market citizen science project. But there's the scope of our work. So I've got 45 minutes to talk, and I don't know how I can cover all of this. But these survey locations are general surveys of birds, but the white locations are all locations where we've banded birds. So you can see we've even extended beyond the Missouri River, not outside the Missouri River's influence, and outside of, into other states as well. This is two years, so we're kind of busy. Um, so we look at our projects by season, because that's how birds work. I guess that's probably how the river work too, is by a seasonal type of thing, from year to year, season to season. Um, and we start with migration. So this is a bird's eye view. You're a bird, you're migrating, you're going from one cap to another, and you see uh, the Missouri River out here, you know, and you see all these corridors, you see a fragmented landscape. Uh, Here's where we set up these little stations, banding stations along the Missouri River. All these birds are spread out on their breeding grounds, they're spread out on their wintering grounds, but their migration they sort of condense. And it gives you that opportunity to get the best snapshot possible of this taxon. So that's what we do. We also study in the breeding season, we're studying marsh birds for one thing. The first year of that project, obviously something that's very influenced by the river. We also look at grasslands. We think, oh gosh, he's got tiny little grassland birds, and I'm here to learn about the river and talk about the river. Well, we're worried about the river and wetlands because of all that habitat loss and wetlands. We're worried about grasslands in much the same way. Grasslands are actually in bigger trouble than wetlands. But the same thing, the same major drivers causing us to lose the wetlands are the same major drivers that are causing us to lose grasslands. Primarily, it's pretty aggressive and unrelenting large-scale agriculture. And it's, not, it's not really kept in check well, and we haven't come up with creative ways to deal with it. But we're trying to monitor these effects. And birds are a really good indicator of these habitats, particularly in grasslands. Here's one, it's all grassland, all grassland, managed grasslands, now by the Department of Conservation in this particular area, trying to restore prairie, but they're slightly different grasslands. It's like having a swamp or a bog, or a bottomland forest, or a successional bottomland forest. And you're gonna get different groups of species of birds within each. And if you measure those, you can tell how well that particular habit is habitat is providing what the birds need, and probably a host of other things that are related. So we survey these things, in the, like for the Department of Conservation, but we've also begun this other project, uh, working with the Audubon Society, where we study grassland birds on cattle ranches. Cattle ranches had to do with the Missouri River. Well, a lot of the large-scale agriculture that's been affecting the river is corn. 85% of corn or so goes to feed cattle and chicken. What if the people that are raising the cattle are feeding them grass instead of corn? So this is a project where it's still in early development with Audubon, but when you're talking to people that have 100,000 acres and they want, they care about birds and they want to do something good, there's some incentive there. There's also some market incentive. So, here's, a, here's another breeding season study that we do here with uh, purple martins. We ban them, but these people are tireless <coughs> caretakers of these birds that raise these large colonies that maintain them and keep very careful track of how well they're doing. They monitor their houses and they record what birds return and how well they do. And we have these stations along the Missouri River and even in Texas County. This year we banded over 1,200 purple birds. Trying to figure out where they're dispersing to where they're going. 
they actually stage after they get done nesting in places along the Missouri River, huge flocks, but they're sort of mysterious to kind of find. Backyard banding project, you might recognize that bird there, white breasted nuthatch, nice little color band. Most nuthatches look a lot alike. You can't tell them apart. But if you put a color band on them, you know the individual bird. And so therefore, you can keep track of what birds come into your feeder, how long it might live, how often it returns, that sort of thing. It's our backyard banding. And this year, we're actually going to monitor grasslands in winter um, and, and see how the birds are doing there because it's pretty well believed that a lot of our grassland birds struggle the most and suffer the most losses in winter. So if you manage a grassland for the summertime, are you also managing it for the winter time? So we're looking at full life cycle kind of thing. Big thing that we do is we standardize our methods. We have several methods that we, we use to study these birds. The primary one is banding, these federal bands here. We do these general surveys, transects, and then you'll see a red transect line there. Somebody walks along it, like that guy in the blue shirt back there. He walked along many of these transects, and you count how many birds you see along that transect at certain distances. There's also um, point counts where you stand in one spot, count how far out they are, and then we use passive acoustic monitoring. This thing has little microphones over here on the sides, and it's programmed to record at any time that you want throughout the day or throughout the year. And you just collect your sound cards at the end and process the data that way. It's really new science. Why would we ban? Why would you put a ban on a bird? Especially if you might not even see the bird again. But especially if the chances are very low that you can see this bird ever again. Well, one thing is to give us an idea how many birds are there. In a specific project, it might be more about how many birds are there. Maybe it's what species of bird that it is what species of birds are arriving at a given time. When did they migrate? Especially with things like climate change, phenology of events is something that's very important to us. How long do they stay? The birds not going to stay in some poor habitat unless they're absolutely forced to. If you provide a good habitat, they're going to stay longer, fatten up longer, maybe even reproduce there, or if it's a migration, just stay there long enough to propel them further in their journey. I would catch them. I'm fast. <laughs> uh, we use what they call mist nets. It's a very fine nets. These are aluminum conduit poles. They're about 12 meters long. And these are very fine nets. The birds hardly see. They just sort of fly into them there. They get tangled up. That becomes a matter of just pulling them out of the nets. They sort of fall in these pockets. Sometimes they go this indigo bunting, it gets something in their wing a little bit, so you know, it's sort of a bark to get it out there. It's my personally, my favorite part of landing is keeping the birds out of the nest. You get to see them up close, and it's, it's, a, it's a good experience. So there's the federal band, band, the actual band right there, size for each particular bird species. Some species have a little variation within species, so those species we know to measure their legs. So the banding process, each bird gets that individual number. It's a numbered band. We record this data. Here's a bird that we catch pretty often. It's a, it's a rose-breasted grosbeak. See those feathers over here, very dark? These ones are very light brown. These are new feathers, those are old feathers. Birds do that process in a timed way throughout the year. It's somewhat predictable, so we can age them based on this criteria. Some birds longer than others, like albatrosses for a very long time. They can go several years. Age and sex ratios, those types of measurements, these things can really tell us how well the birds are doing. Sometimes we get birds in, they just flew through a hurricane or a tornado, and they are weak in muscle development, they're too fat. Sometimes we get birds that are little Butterballs are doing so well. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing, real life. 
So here's the transect that you saw. And just to give you a view of what it's like, so you're walking along, counting birds along this transect. Boom, boom, boom. Counting birds, writing the distance down, how far away they are along the transect. Here's a point count. So if you stood there and did a point count, you're trying to measure the species of animal or bird or whale, whatever it is that people use this technique. It'd be hard to count that bird. That's a big sizzle right there, right where you're standing and grasping it. That bird's not going to be under your feet. It's probably going to be away. So we sort of prefer transects because we don't miss birds at zero on transects typically. You can look up the line and see them right at zero. We just learned this program really well. I actually went to a workshop on this program it was statistical analysis. And that way, we use this data to sort of generate an idea of density and relative abundance of these birds in these areas. Here's the last method that we use. Then I'll go into a little more um, about where we're studying. But uh, these autonomous recording units are sort of a front end of science. It's still in development. They're not perfect, but they're a really, really, really good tool. Um, we use them terrestrially mainly for marsh birds right now. And uh, I'm experimenting on the grasslands. But if you're looking to detect a very non abundant species, it can cost a lot of time and money to send people out all over the place, stomping around, trying to find the bird. And you can leave these out for a long time, bring them back in, and use somewhat sophisticated software to scan for that evil in the haystack. Is this not, not very abundant species even showing up at all for this 10 day period? And I don't need to send somebody out there every day to go look for it. I can just leave that there. If that bird is vocalizing, which we set these out passengers when they do vocalize, we'll figure it out. It also helps with our statistics. You don't have to know this formula. <laughs> it's a really cool formula, though. I like it. Um, what, it, what it does is it, it gives us an idea of calling rates. If you do it at the right time, it gives you more robustness to your data to determine if that species is there or how many are there, if you know how often they're calling. This is good by some friends that uh, do uh, whale research. So it's counting whale blows or how many times they surface and that sort of thing. Now I actually use this, and this is a lot of fun. It's night flight calls. It's a platform up at night. All birds, most birds, migrate at night. You know, the, the, as, they, as they fly over, they, they communicate with one another through calls. You know, it's just like little chips. You hear a bird just play through little chips. It's not the full song, but it's this little communication. It's like, hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm still here too, man. Keep going. And, and it's those things that we pick up on. And if, if you look at radar, you can say, wow, there's a big flock of birds moving. This is a big flock moving right over the Gulf. They just crossed the Gulf of Mexico. Now they're flying up there. Cool birds. But what are they? I mean, they could be any, any one of our groups of birds. It could be a groups of areas. It could be a bunch of thrushes. It could be warblers. It could be sparrows. I don't know. But if we have night flight calls, wow. Not only do birds each have different songs, but they have different flight calls. So you can recognize them differently. He's a black and white warbler. He's got a pretty cool pattern. This is time, this is frequency. So he's got his, it's up and down, up and down. It's a Z. It's like a little Z. It's more something like a cerulean warbler, if you know that. It's Z. And these guys, he's more like a see you, see you. American Red Star. So as you record these at night, you can run a detector software in the program, and then you throw a look through and say, okay, I've got a bunch of red stars, I've got a bunch of black and white blower, and you get the idea. Then we have the banding station there, the other method that we're looking at, and we can pull samples out and actually measure them physically and see how they're going. So here's, we're getting more towards the meat of the matter here. As you can see, some, some of you may know that we've got these migratory flyways, what people call them flyways, north and south, you know, you're going to have a, 
black pool warbler is coming all the way down here. These birds coming all the way down here. It's, it's a great concept. It was developed by some duck guys a long time ago. But um, actually, it's a little more complex because there's a lot of little corridors in here. And so we're trying to measure those. Not only the repairing corridors in the river, but also other types of corridors. So here's some of the birds we're looking at on these corridors and on these flyways. This little tiny bird, I think that's my hand right there holding this one, but Joanna had one in her hand today. The Wilson Warbler. Look at his range up here. That little bird flies all the way down here. He doesn't do it in one shot. He needs to stop older someplace. So if they winter here, and they, they breathe up here, where are they stopping? And how long do they stop for? What happens when they cross these great lakes and they funnel through and they pile up here? Tons and tons of them it might not even be the best habitat, but they pile up down here and they pile up right there. And they're trying to get down here and they have to fly over the great corn desert. You know? So what happens when they get through that? What do they look like? That's what we're trying to do for the little, little Wilson Ford. We call them Weebler or Cat Man. He's got a little cat. They're really nice. You guys spend some time on the river as you see this one. It breathes near us in our range over here. We call them lemons. It's a planetary warbler. He's a cavity nesting warbler, but he likes the bottom, the bottom land forest. I'm like, wow, how does it move? Like, where is it going? You know it's having a tough time. Its population has decreased like 40% since 1966. And it depends on these flooded bottom land forests. You know, what's going on there? Where is it moving and when? This is a current data. Watch where it comes from. It's migrating up, migrating up. Breeding seasons arrive. That's where it's breeding. And then it migrates back down. I mean, it's pretty obvious what habitat this bird is using where it's migrating. I mean, let's look at that again. There's the Mississippi River. There's the Missouri River. You see Mississippi going up there. It's using those repairing corridors. I mean, it's a major focal point for these birds. I mean, this is what they're depending on. And so if we have major flood events or really weird things happening in an unnatural way on the river, Probably going to affect a lot of their nesting territory and migratory um, habitat. Indigo bunting. Now, this bird breeds all over. Every thicket. We had our friend telling us today is a Brazilian friend who's in it. Went to Missouri Valley College. He said, Those indigo buntings are right behind the college campus. I'm like, Yeah, they're everywhere. But it, if you look at them, they're all breeding all over. This is where they winter. I have a friend down in the Yucatan that catches quite a few of them. Thousand a year. They have a, this migratory pathway that they take. Pretty similar. They spread out a little bit more, but they're still found in you know, the areas of the major continental feeders, which are our watersheds. So now we say, okay, this is cool. We live in Missouri. Let's study birds here and let's study them on the Missouri River. But where are we going to go? Here's where we are in central Missouri. Not many riparian zones here. Maybe some, some woods here, little narrow spots here, narrow spots here. This is Grand Pass Conservation Area. All 5,000 acres of it. And when Lewis and Bar came through, it sort of went like this. You can see all those swales in there. So, so let's set up on this riparian zone here. Let's, let's start landing here all night. Let's just see what happens. We're not going to claim to be the greatest scientists in the world. We just want to get some baseline data, document it, and say, this is what's going on here. That's what we did. That's repairing the zone. And we, we did a couple little areas around there, too. Later on, we developed these areas. This area nearby, Van Meter State Park. One marsh that hasn't been messed with, one of the few in Missouri. Here's our recurring zone that we started out with. It's about 175 meters across here. Pretty tall stand of timber, but a pretty decent understory, like you'd see in a secondary bottom of a river. Pretty decent. And I'll just let you see some of the birds here. 
just just to see some of them here. See if I can do this right.
There's the fall site. <laughs> There's the pump house. It's a grand pass that pump all the channels out. We used to take this road right back here, drive back here to our landing site. Was, I was sort of confused at that moment. What we're going to do? I think a lot of people were. So that water stayed down there. Probably for a long period of time that it wouldn't normally stay up that high. By what happened? We had no understory the next year. That's why our net herds per net hour were so low. They just didn't have the habitat. It's gone there. So we sat around scratching our heads and drank some time and said, oh, fall 2012. What are we, we going to do? Well, here's where our old fall site was, and our spring site was also on the river side of the We decided to move it over here. <laughs> Just started last week. It was not fun to cut that lane through that thick stuff, but we, we got through it. This is where the flood of 93 breached, right in here. Blew all the way out through here. We're actually sitting on top of a couple few feet of sand right there. A bunch of willow thickets. We figure this will be a pretty good area. But time will tell. We're not here to do research for a year or two and tell you what's happening exactly. This is this is what's happening. We do long-term research. So only we're gonna have any data to compare anything to anyways. So we'll see. I think it's gonna be pretty good. That's our pastrons. Let's look at our migration of pastrons along the Missouri River. What other birds do we have to worry about? Been on the river. Well, we've lost over 4 million acres of wetland habitat in Missouri, and most of that's river dependent wetlands. Most of it, known fact, is associated with the river and streams. Most of the loss has come from agriculture. Development. This is something we know. This is a world graph, worldwide graph. This isn't just happening in Missouri, it's happening everywhere. But whales, sorry, I can't read this very well. Whales, crates, and animals, these are marsh birds. In the world of all water birds throughout the world, they have the biggest extinction rate, extinct, largely declining more rapidly than any of the group of birds out there. So I figured we had to see what kind of these birds do we have in Missouri. Well, we've got some king rails, a couple of known black rails, pretty secret data on that. Sora, Virginia rail, yellow rail, American bitterns, beast bitterns, look at all these. Group, the same group of birds here in Missouri. So, what do the bird groups say about it? What does the Audubon say? What does the Department of Conservation say about it? What does the federal government say about it? Well, they all list them. They all list them. In decline, even that, or we don't know what's going on with them because they're so secretive. But, uh, loss of emergent wetlands is the main underlying feature there. So I'm glad I showed you these birds. I want you to look at them again, actually. There's our king rail. Yeah, I guess they say, some people say he's like 30 to 60 centimeters of water or something like that. Little tiny black rail. This guy's an enigma. You look at range maps where there's questions everywhere. Very hard to find. Very rare. Extremely rare bird. About the size of a sparrow. Same group as that king rail, so he's not going to use that deep water. He's going to use some more shallow water. These Sora, they're just everywhere in migration. Not as many breeding pairs here in Missouri. Virginia rail, hunted species. They migrate through really pretty good numbers in Missouri. Some overwinter, too. Some actually have been known to breed here. Same with the yellow rail. They're a small bird, secret species. I mean, you never knew they're there. It's not like a cricket frog. I think of it as like a secretary out there working really hard. She, she or he, these guys glasses on, 
But I've got friends in the Smithsonian, good friends, doing lots of quantitative studies on cats. Cats kill like over a billion of these birds that we've just been looking at every year. I mean, picture a little hummingbird that you're feeding every day. That little hummingbird crossed the Gulf of Mexico, came all the way up there, burned with this beautiful male ruby throat, raising its young, and the male's worthless. The male just takes off. You know, then the cat nails the mama hummingbird, and then there's nothing left in the uh, horror stories. So keep your cats indoors, and their lives are half if you let them outside. It's physically proven, so that's my point. That's the only thing. Also, you can do housing. These little river birds here, these pedantary warblers have declined so much. Here's some kid, I think he's in South Carolina, they had a nest box program that threw an Audubon together green grant and started putting up and monitoring the planetary workers. Those little guys are like, yeah, I got the planetary workers, how about you? <laughs> pretty cool. And you can do those types of things. There's lots of other things you can do for the birds and spread the awareness. What about the river? What can we do? We're at a point here where there's a lot of economic power and pressures and things that are like, have a little more weight than we do. We're going to have to be digging a little deeper. We're going to have to get a little bit smarter. Because you know the people with power and influence that don't care about the resources as much are using their heads. So we're going to have to do something. Be positive and creative. We're smart enough. Organization, whatever you believe. And how many other partner organizations do you have? Like minded people that really care. Maybe most of them just work too hard to have the time to do much. But it means you can, you can find them. We can all talk together. We can all do something. We can use vote wisely. Our friends just vote wisely. Vote for what you really care about. This really matters to you. Vote for somebody that's going to be thinking about these things a little bit. Find solutions, be creative problem solvers. Giving positive experiences to people like that kid there. Most of all, enjoy it. Try to share it, enjoy it with others. Get them on the river, take them down there. So I mean, we're all here in the same boat. Not doing anything new. I don't know if you hear it. I don't think we have a sound. But maybe I can shoot with this thing. Here's some of the things I enjoy about the river right here. Studies going on in the 
East Coast with Pat Sprint using that. There was huge arrays of microphones studying green organisms using that. So you can, but it takes some work. Still on the front end of it. I think it needs to include that before. So this is a, this is a map Yeah. So what do the birds do? Are they going somewhere else? Are they dying? Are they what's happening with those birds? In migration, in their migration habitat. Also, there are some breeding birds there too, like our wood thrushes. We usually have many wood thrushes on territory in these spots, and they weren't there. They had to go someplace else. So. Was it some place that was good for them or not? We don't know. If you go out to a prairie and you go out to a wetland and you hear a bird singing or a few of them say, oh, this is good habitat, they might be doing all right. I don't know. You have to measure them and see how well they're producing. Because many of these areas, especially over time, after we fragmented the habitat so much, we're left with habitat that looks sort of good to birds, it draws them in, but they're not producing enough numbers to actually grow and sustain the population. So we call those sinks. So it might be going from a good source area of producing young well to a sink area which actually does more harm than good to their population. We don't know. We don't know. All I can tell you is in that particular area, it went it went down. And with the levee system, it's not going out and flooding the areas and creating that newer habitat and trading it out. And unless that old natural cycle is replicated in some way, it's going to be sort of a net loss, I think, of habitat rather than if you had an open area where the river's allowed to naturally flood and inundate an area and allowed to go through those natural processes and reinstate and re if they would have a new ephemeral habitat springing up and say, no problem, here's a new spot to go to. So, I think those individuals will be okay with their offspring. Okay, I don't know. There's a great deal of interest right now in the historical all moisture patterns in the upper Missouri River because history talks about more drought and more floods. And that lends its way into our lifetimes. Do you see significant change if they do go into the extended drought north? And what would that change in your river? Droughts, flooding, mini ice ages, climate change. I don't know. I have no idea, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to document what does happen. I'm going to know not only the birds with these acoustic units, but the bugs, what their timing is, what's happening there. I think some of these birds will be more flexible and others won't. Birds that are down in Central and South America, and they come up here, they get what they call zogaru, the migratory restlessness, and come up here. They don't know what the habitat's going to be like or what our weather's going to be like when we get there. If we've had a late frost and early frost and long winter, they don't know. When they get here, they just hope the timing's right. The resident birds and things probably will be able to adapt a little bit better. Long distance migrants probably have a tough time. So I don't know. I, it doesn't seem good to me. A lot of these evolutionary changes and things that happened with after the late Miocene and last uh, ice ages, uh, the last glaciers, that was the last period of real rapid evolution in birds, so they say. So if things happen too rapidly, I don't know if they can keep up with it. I would probably doubt it. I mean, we're already losing birds more rapidly than we ever have, more rapidly losing species. So, Probably not. We gotta slow things down. Sir, this probably goes on all of your uh, your last question, but are you tracking the insects, patches, and that kind of stuff, and saw the, and see the songbirds that don't match up what they used to? 
there was the birds and the bees talk. Oh. That was the last week. <laughs> what is that? What well, day? Yeah, I, I think um, I wish I knew more about bugs. I need more bug specialists and entomologists. And I would love to have you go through my recordings and see the timing of these singing insects uh, morning and all night and when it happens. And they're all tied together in some way. You know, you make it awful hard for the hatch if there wasn't the insects. I mean, the birds or the insects. If they're all tied together in, in this way, and that birds can adapt quickly if the right hatch isn't there at the right time and maybe feed on something else. Maybe. I've seen them be adaptable, but some of them are very, very specific. And those are the ones that are going to be in trouble. I think if we restore the habit, habitat and we restore the floristic community, birds are not habitat generalists. They're pretty specific. And they'll be good indicators of how well we've done that. So, are you seeing uh, more southern birds that are starting to become native or habituated to this area that you hadn't seen in 2010 or anything like that? There's examples like that. Maybe not in the way that you would normally think, but for instance, there are no scissor tail flycatchers. Scissor tail flycatchers, have you seen them? They're at the Royal Stadium or something? No, those are cute birds. They got long tails, really beautiful, elegant birds, and like sort of this savanna, grasslandy habitat. Their numbers are going up. They're spreading north here. Wow, we must be doing something pretty good with our savanna habitats. Actually, they do love savanna habitats on their wintering grounds down south as well. So all those non-shade grown deforesting coffee plants have created this nice savanna habitat. So we'll continue to see the numbers go up because they're ruining their habitat down south. So there are some effects like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think there has been over time some, some shifts like that, mainly habitat related more than climate. So yes, ma'am. <laughs> In relation to this gentleman's question, do you want to speak about um, how we see a higher diversity at the marsh because of the flora? I mean, I think that it's just a hypothesis at this point, but I think it's uh, pretty good Yeah, I don't know if I can get there very quick on that. But um, this really sort of says it pretty well. Where's that map? Right here. That sort of shows it, not really. Just to the east over here, this Van Meter Marsh. Sort of intact natural wetland, hasn't been plowed, messed with. Beautiful, beautiful place. And we see a lot of great diversity there just because the foresty that diverse. I mean, it's, a, it's a direct reflection of that. So as we're experimenting around, we have some pretty solid set sites in the spring, but as we're experimenting around in prairies and other places during migration, we're looking at pretty specific habitats. We're looking at measuring things like different CRP practices, those types of things, and, and see how those habitats will affect them. This is all pretty thick willowy. And um, not as floristically diverse as Van Meter, but it's in better shape than these things inside the levee right now. So, is that what you were getting at? Well, I was thinking more of like desert birds or something like that working their way northward because uh, it so, seems like it's getting hotter around here. Well, sir, it seems to be. It seems also that there's, I talked to some biologists that are older than me, and smarter than I am, they've been doing it a lot longer, 
these guys up north, they're sure that some of their wildlife management plans, they're just going to pitch out the window because they won't be able to continue to manage for those species no matter how hard they try because of that climate change. And it affects not only the native species and their movements and who's going to be there and who's not, but also greatly increases in case of species propagation. I think, you know, we look at these habitats the same way we got wetlands, forests, different types of forests, different types of wetlands, different types of deserts, different types of beach communities, these things. I think with climate change, we'll probably have different new ones. We'll probably have different types of riverine habitats and different things that we've never seen in this hemisphere before. It'll be different. It's tough to keep up with. Uh, so, I'm going to go micro on you. Oh, wow. You've been all macro, which is really awesome, and thank you for taking it there. So, I was just curious, um, and this map's a good example, this, this, what, I guess the first site you had. Um, what can you say about, like, the importance of, of the cottonwood tree? To Populous deltoides? Yeah. Uh, what is it about that tree that's so important? If you're going micro, a tree in itself, itself can create its own microclimate. But uh, structurally, the tree is important. It also, I'll bring, I, I gotta go macro on it. <laughs> um, in early history of this in the States, there's, there's an old painting from New England where I'm from, from early settlers before we logged on it. And uh, one painting is called We Dined Inside a Hollow Cottonwood Tree. And there's like 12 guys at a table dining inside a cottonwood tree. And I think of a tree that size, and we had a few of them. Over the whole lifespan of that one particular tree, which can handle a lot of fluctuation in water, how many birds did that sustain? Whether it was through migration, through nesting, through whatever else. Just birds alone. What type of effect did it? How did it stabilize the banks where it was? How did it affect the landscape as a structure, as a pillar there? I don't know. How, how did it affect? Uh, one species of tree. Pretty important, I guess. I don't, I don't know what else to say. When they when they showed in Missouri about nine thousand years ago, when they started, probably when we were in a boreal forest. So after the last nine thousand years, probably quite a bit. Is that good? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, you know, many of us are concerned about water quality, trash, the waterways, the streams, the river. A lot of times, environmentalists are tied to the same group of tree huggers and bird watchers. The educational events for our children in schools today. You see the pictures of the birds in your hands. They are enamored with that. The science is just incredible. That gets them excited. But we don't tell them what happens if all the birds were eradicated in water. We understand that if you run out of water, which is not a real resource, what happens and how important that is. But we don't eat those birds, and so a lot of politicians in a certain part of society, so what? We don't have the birds, so what? They don't understand the impact that it has beyond bird watching. And what do you tell them? How do you get their attention as to how important these birds and migratory routes and patterns are? Things are over to that camera. It is an election year. Yep. No, I. I mean, I sit around with a lot of 
people into alcohol partners and stuff, you know, so people have been doing this type of thing their whole whole lives. And, you know, I, I, at first I don't believe, I mean, I grew up hunting and fishing, and like, my favorite meat is duck, and I study birds. And, you know, I don't believe in any of the polarized hogwash of the liberal industry and all that stuff that's out there. I guess I'll start with the first part of your question, and that is, um, what do you tell the kids? What we learned really is this, at that last um, Flying Wild facilitator training, national training, they did this study on these kids. There's 40 or 50 kids. They brought them up, telling them about Rachel Carlson's sound spring, all that stuff. Told them over and over, made them extremely conscientious, and they found out when they got to be out of the house after teenage development. Anybody bring up environment or their diet or their conscientious perspective, and they just put on the blinders. They acted like somebody that was amused is that much of a reaction to it. So how do you do it? You give them good positive experiences. You show them why we love it. And if they can't see it, there's nothing else we can do. I don't know what else to do. But that would be our solution, I guess. That's fine. I don't have any great ideas. That's why we're here. We gotta put our heads together and figure it out together. I mean, if those are the exact questions we want to ask, or is there other questions we haven't even thought about asking yet that might propose the solution eventually? Are they being victimized by cats or cats just taking out 
the things I'm worried about. You know, if you're living in the country, you probably can't take out some rare birds, but if you're living closer to an urban environment, you probably have more house birds and starlings and stuff like that. But if you're out there next to one of these prairies, you're probably hitting hens, little sparrows, and grasshopper sparrows. You're not getting any warblers. No? Right. That's not bringing them home. They're already eating. They don't get up. I mean, most warblers are up in the air. Are you right. looking for me to justify you?